Hello, good people. Welcome back to my shop. It's another issue episode of the Renaissance Woodworker Live. Uh, let me just uh, get the chat room up here, guys. So uh, today, what am I doing today? I don't know what I'm doing today. Something. I'm going to be um, working on part two of this perch build. There. Just pop out the chat real quick. All right. So uh, last time I focused on the legs and the design pattern for those legs. So this little piece of plywood, it's got all my layout for both the two rear legs and the front leg. And here's the front leg and here are the two rear legs. So I got all that nicely turned and I used my tapered tenon cutter to cut the tapered uh, tenons on the end with half inch at the smallest diameter. So the legs are prepped, ready to go. I had some people ask last time about making octagonal legs. So if you've paid attention to my website or this YouTube channel at all, you saw that I put out a video this week on making octagonal legs. So here's just a, a poplar blank that uh, tapers from one and three quarters down to one inch. And it's a nice, pretty octagon. To prepare this leg from here, um, I would still use the taper tenon cutter to cut around taper tenon on the end. But more than likely what I would do is come in with a knife or a draw knife or something like that and just kind of quickly hog off a lot of the material to get down to that taper tenon. There are certainly tapered tenon um, like log turning tools that will come in and create like a curved shoulder. I'm not terribly concerned about the shoulder at this point. It is going to curve um, into the round and you can actually cut that in once you've got it set, say it's sitting at an angle on this leg. Once you've got it set in there, you can scribe around and actually create a square shoulder so that the leg comes up flat against the table, the stool, whatever it is you're doing. That's all stuff that gets done um, once you've got it fitted. But that was the octagonal leg, was just kind of a side, side project to work on. Today, what I'm gonna do is actually bore the holes in the seat for the legs. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, how we bore at those angles, because these are compound angles we're working on. We're going to ream the holes so that the mortises fit nicely. And ideally, assuming we have time, because I do have kind of a hard stop at uh, one o'clock or 1.10-ish today, uh, I will start carving the seat. But speaking of the seat, I do want to talk a little bit about the pattern here. So this is the seat pattern that I've created. Let me guys get you a little bit closer on that. And... Put a little bit of light there. So this seat pattern is oval-ish. <laughs> I've got a continuous radius on the back here, and then I've got matching radii down here, but there is a slight flat in the front. And actually, <clears throat> I came back and created a little bit of a flat on the sides. A lot of people will use just half a pattern. You know, you lay out half and then flip it over and lay out the other half. And you're all referencing off a center line on the pattern and a center line on the blank. I actually like to create, uh, for something like this, I like to create the full pattern because I've got precise areas to lay out where the legs are and everything on both sides of the pattern. And the less I have to shift it, just the easier it is. I also like to make my patterns out of um, plywood stock. This is eighth inch, actually a little thinner than that plywood stock. This is the stuff that actually uh, bundles of plywood get packaged in, so it's kind of wrapped in a two by four crate and then clad in this really thin stuff. I pick it up at the lumber yard all the time. Anybody who is receiving, um, well, plywood, you know, any, any home center that's receiving plywood is gonna have 
This is like the, the pallets of plywood shipping. You can pick this stuff up at cabinet shops, lumber yards, all kinds of stuff. I grab like two or three sheets of the stuff and I've been working on it for a couple of years. You can use poster board, you can even use paper. I just kind of like a little bit, something with a little bit more meat that uh, I can hang on the wall and it's not gonna fall apart on me. So on this, first things first, what I did is I kind of played with and sketched this circle. This is drawing heavily, heavily from the pattern that Peter Galbert put out on his website. I have made it a little bit deeper and just a little bit wider for a larger bottomed individual and um, just kind of played with the curves a little bit more. So this was just a simple matter of kind of laying out the, the rectangle that I wanted it to fit into. I laid in the center line and then um, Peter laid in some um, patterns here, uh, the location from the front edge to the legs, front edge to the legs, how far apart they were spaced, and then a spot up the center line that I want to say is like nine and a quarter inches or something like that. This intersection of the center line and the leg locations creates the sight lines. We'll talk about sight lines when we start boring, but those are the important things. The center line, the location of the front leg, which is right on the center, the 22 degree resultant angle that we're going to use here, the sight lines from the two legs, the locations of the legs, the 10 degree resultant angle along the sight line, and then I've got two holes here that mark the deepest part of the carving at 5 eighths of an inch deep. That's all the stuff that I've marked on there. This is really all I need to lay out the geometry and to carve the seat. <clears throat> so I put in all these numbers still inside of a rectangle, and then I used a compass to create this continual arc, and then just kind of sketched a little, hand sketched to create a curve that I kind of liked, did a lot of erasing, a lot of refining of that. <clears throat> and then I just went to my bench, sawed it out, and used a rasp. And actually, I used one of these very slick two-handed rasps. If you've seen my Instagram channel at all, you saw I was creating this pattern using this two-handed rasp. Um, I just kind of refined the shape on this lower quarter and then refined the half to get it to a way I liked it. <clears throat> I then took this the way I liked it, traced it onto a piece of paper, scissored that out, came over and transferred that onto the other side and then shaped that. So it was just a way of, of creating a little bit of symmetry here rather than since I was doing such freehand sketching, there's no way that I could really expect that to transfer over to the other side. So again, you could just be fine with just half the pattern, but seeing as I wanted to create the whole pattern, I ended up having to take kind of an extra step to create half the pattern, transfer it, flip it to transfer to the other side, and then refine the whole thing. I do recommend that. I just, I don't know, there's something about having the full pattern here and something that is um, heavier than like a poster board or, or just regular old paper. And uh, I shaped it and just sanded the edges so there's no splinters or anything like that. And that is <coughs> my seat plank. Now, I should say uh, in the chat room, anybody who does have questions, feel free to pipe up. Uh, do me a favor and put them in all caps if you would, please, because it just makes it so much easier for me to keep track of stuff. So the, um, the next thing here is you've got to have a blank for your seat. This requires the, the seat pattern itself is running across the grain. So if you're looking at the front of the seat, it's running the same direction actually as the face grain of the plywood. That wasn't my intention, but in hindsight, I want to say that I did that on purpose because it helped me remember which way to orient the grain. Um, so the grain's running this way. I'm setting the seat this way. So you can see I've got a fair amount of wood back here, and I want to leave that in place for now because I, this makes a great place to clamp stuff while I'm carving. I can bring two holdfasts back here and carve all in this front area. Um, but you're going to need a blank, at least if you're using a pattern like this, you're going to need a blank that's 15 and a quarter inches long, and it needs to be 13 inches wide. I've got one that's about 14 and three quarters wide. Like I said, if you've got a little extra room so you can grab onto stuff while you're carving, that's great. It's not imperative because there will be areas in the seat while we're carving that we can use a hold fast to hold on to it. The next thing is what I need. To, so once you've got this blank, you need to get it somewhat flat. This is not perfectly flat. There was a pretty wicked twist in this board to start with. 
And there is actually a fair amount of, sorry, There we go. Well, that was weird. It's like the, um, hold tight one second, guys. We've got a little weird funkiness going on with the camera. Okay, I think that may have it. All right, just to double check that everybody can see what's going on here. Just cycling through some stuff. Is that better? Well, crap. I'm terribly sorry, technical issues. My um, uh, GoPro was registering, but I guess it was frozen, so. That sucks. Um, so there's going to be a nice little dead frozen spot right in the middle of this presentation that people on YouTube can yell at me about. Um, wow. What was the last thing you guys heard me say? It's probably uh, talking about the seat blank. Crap. Um, all right. Well, I'll just review. Um, the seat pattern is actually the face grain on the plywood is actually oriented the same way that I want the grain on the seat to run. I would like to say that I was smart enough to think of that ahead of time. It was just kind of a happy accident. So the grain of the seat blank is actually running from side to side as you're looking at the seat. So you guys are looking at the front of the seat. Got it oriented that way, which means you're going to need, if you're using a pattern like this, you're going to need a blank that is 15 and a quarter inches long and it needs to be 13 inches wide. Now I've got extra width here, which is nice because as I'm carving out the seat, I've got this area in the back that I can actually hold on to. So I'm not actually going to cut the outer perimeter of the seat out yet. I really want this extra wood to use hold fast and stuff for carving. Obviously, if you don't have a blank this wide, there's still other areas while you're carving, like right here in the front, you can use a hold fast while you're carving back here. You can also use hold fast along the edges because there does remain a little bit of a flat around the edges until the very last steps. So, um, Certainly the wider you have to be able to hold on to, the better. Um, then you do need to prep the blank a little. It needs to be flat-ish and relatively parallel on both faces. This particular board had a really wicked twist in it. So I had to do a fair amount of planing of the corners to, to drop it down. And as is, there's still a little bit of a high spot right on this corner. If you look, I've got a real rough sawn area here that I just haven't planed away. Um, I'm not terribly concerned about that because as you see, I'm going to orient the seat pattern down here and that high corner is, is way up here. It's gonna be sawn away eventually or draw knifed away. So it's a perfect example of I could keep working until this was perfectly flat, but I'm just gonna end up reducing my overall stock for something that's gonna be sawn away. Fastest way to flatten a board is to saw it to shape, but in this particular case, I, I do want to leave that extra for work holding. So get it to a, a relatively flat surface, most importantly, so that it doesn't, it registers firmly on your bench, whatever your work surface is, and it's not rocking around. So that being said, actually, I want to see, is there a face that I like better than another? I think I'm going to put this face up because this has um, kind of a cooler grain pattern to it. This face, I don't have the cathedral. This face I do. So that's kind of, as I lay that in place there, I'm going to have this kind of center cathedral pattern running right up the seat. I think that'll look kind of cool. So I'm going to orient the blank. And as I said, there's a tiny bit of a flat in the pattern right at the front here. I'm going to orient it a 
right here. Just go ahead and trace around that. Mark my center line extents. I'm going to use my scratch all to poke through the holes in the pattern to locate the leg locations. And my two depth holes, the deepest part of the carving. So with that information, I can come back and lay out my center line. So I've got this little tick mark on the center line and I know that the leg is on the center line. So I've got my center. Crap, I forgot something. Again, lining up the center. I've got a little point on my center line that marks where the sight lines come from. Now I've got, where did I put my lumber crayon? There it is. What I want to do is circle the holes where the legs go, just to make it stupid obvious. These are the spots that I'm boring. And if I line up the whole of the leg with that little mark I made on the center line, that will give me my resultant angles, or my sight lines rather, not resultant angles. Okay, so I know it's a little hard to see uh, with just the pencil marks, but let's talk a little bit about sight lines and resultant angles and all that fun stuff. These legs are, this is the top of the chair, but we'll just pretend it's the back. Um, need a wider angle. So the legs are actually raked forward in this chair because you remember the whole seat is kind of angled towards the front. So the legs are splayed out and they're also raked forward. On a normal Windsor chair, you know, they're going to be raked back and splayed out and raked forward and splayed out in the front. This angle, as I splay it out and I rake it forward or back, this angle is a compound angle. And there's all kinds of you know calculations and crap you can do. But ultimately, if I am raked and splayed, let's see if I can do this with the camera. There comes a point as you walk around this chair where eh, it's so hard to do. It comes a point where as you're looking at it, you're now just this leg is now straight up and down. It's not splayed or anything like that. It's just a simple angle now because you're on that sight line. That sight line is what makes the leg look straight up and down. As I move it just a little bit one way, now it's not straight up and down anymore. You're off that sight line. So when you determine what those sight lines are, you're simplifying the boring process from a compound angle to just a simple angle. It's 90 degrees in one direction and angle in another direction. That angle is what's called the resultant angle. <clears throat> Um, if you haven't figured it out by now, I'm a major fanboy of Peter Galbert. Um, he's got great videos on sight lines, uh, really good visual representations of kind of the geometry and how that works. He's also got a sight line ruler. Um, you can get it on his blog, you can get it in his book that will help you to calculate sight lines. Um, really, it's using like old framing square tricks. For the purposes of this demo, we're just going to 
suspend the explanations and say, we figured out that the resultant angle is 10 degrees here. So as I put this leg on the line and I sight down my sight line and go out 10 degrees, that's where it's gonna go. So all I've gotta do is set a bevel gauge to 10 degrees. This is not 10 degrees, this is just me ex explaining. So I've got this bevel gauge set up at 10 degrees. I set it on my sight line, line the leg up to that, and you could bring in a square next to it because now I've simplified things to the point where it just needs to be 90 degrees here. And I have created that resultant angle that splays actually the leg forward and off at an angle. It's kind of a fun little trick. You can use a series of bevel gauges and squares and mirrors and all that fun stuff in order to line up everything. I actually just find that I, I've just over the years have gotten really good at boring square holes. I can, I can look down at one direction and I can keep it square this way. And all I really need is a single bevel to come in and kind of turn my head to the side in order to maintain that particular angle. So the front leg is the sight line is actually the center of the seat. So it might actually make a little bit more sense since this front leg is right smack in the center of the seat and it is just splaying forward. So in this case, it really, it is a simple angle. There is no, sorry, it's raking forward. There is no splay at all. So in this case, I just need an angle or a bevel right on the center line and 22 degrees, it rakes forward at 22 degrees and we bore that hole. It was a ridiculously fast explanation of how sight lines work, but such is life. Um, so how do I want to do? I want to set this up on some blocks. Or I'm going to just knock over my scrap pile. First, I'm going to put my four plane away so I don't knock it on the floor. There are some schools of thought that say you should bore your holes from the underside of the seat and others that say bore from the top of the seat and others that say I don't really care. Um, I've done both. Uh, I don't really have an opinion to tell you the truth on which way you should bore. I think it works perfectly fine. trying to orient this in such a way that I make sure that I'm not going to bore into my supports. I always have a dog hole right where I want to put the hold fast. I always have a bench dog right where I want to put the hold fast. It's not going anywhere. So let's start with the easy leg first. Front leg, 22 degree resultant angle on the sight line. Dan, you really have a problem with my pencils. Why do you have such a problem with my pencils? It's being conservative, man. As you, as you sharpen the pencil, it gets shorter. So if so do you get to a point where you just start throwing away pencils? No, man, that's what the short pocket's for. Or is it just the erasers that I never use? Yeah, that's probably more your issue. So I'm gonna use my Veritas uh, 
fun bevel gauge here to or bevel setter, whatever we're calling this thing, to set this to 22 degrees. So I've basically just set the fence on this thing to 22 degrees. By the way, um, this is like probably one of my proudest tools. It's a Chris Vesper uh, six inch bevel gauge. Chris, if you ever listen to this, you're a genius, man. These things are just awesome. So awesome. So um, I'm gonna be boring from the top down. So it's important to kind of do a gut check here and think about which way do I have to bore? So I've got 22 degrees set up, right? Well, if I bore along this angle, from the top. Now, instead of the leg splaying out like it should, it's going to splay in and then we're going to have a real kind of nasty balancing thing. So I think I'm going to go ahead and reset this just the other way. Um, I don't really have enough room to set the bevel on the outboard side here. So I'm just going to change the orientation. So it's still at 22 degrees, but now it's going the other way. So now I know if I bore and match that angle, rather, see, because I'm on the top, the leg's going to splay out the appropriate way. So before you start boring any time, just take that minute to do a little bit of a gut check. Make sure that you're not uh, um, boring the wrong way. And if I'm going to bore, ha, 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 you already... Uh, joke has already been made about what a boring session this is. Um, what are we doing here? We're going to bore half inch holes. Uh, there's any number of bits you could use. Some people will use a traditional spoon bit here. I like a longer bit because it gives me uh, a longer access with which to sight down. Um, a lot of folks will just use plain old Brad point bits for this. I like to stack the cards in my favor by using a longer shanked bit so that I can more clearly see the angle. I also use a shorter sweep brace. Uh, instead of what you may more traditionally find is the, the 10 inch swing brace, this is actually a six inch swing. So I've got a three inch offset. So it only scribes a six inch circle. The tighter that circle, the more kind of in line I stay with things. When the brace is out here, you've got more of a chance to rock because you're swinging a wider arc. It's probably, it's probably something in my head. To me, I feel like I can bore a straighter hole with a smaller, um, smaller sweep. I was watching Curtis Buchanan the other day and uh, he has several moments in his videos where he's talking about building, um, this was specifically the comeback. And he's like, you know, this is the way I do it. It's probably not the right way to do it, but it's the way I've been doing it for 20 years and I'm not gonna change now. He's like, or in other instances, he's like, I don't know why this is, that's just the way I do it. <laughs> Sometimes just suspend, uh, suspend the questions and go, this is the way we're gonna do it. So I'm gonna set a square perpendicular to my sight line. And I'm going to gift you guys a little bit of a better camera angle. Never judge the man by the length of his pencil. Or, the man's comfortable using a short pencil probably means he's got nothing to worry about. Ah, and now my live session is degraded to that. It had to happen eventually. So I've got my 22 degree angle set up at the angle that I want in the right orientation. I've got my square over here, perpendicular to my sight line. So I can bring this square up and I can say, all right, that's, that's 90 degrees. And I just wanna get the lead screw started here. And then I wanna lean
Just want to go real slow here just to get the wings of the, the bit started cutting because they will have a tendency as the wings cut in at an angle to want to um, push things out of the way. Now, keep in mind, I am going to go back and ream this hole exactly the way I want it. So if I end up boring slightly off this 22 degree angle, it's not the end of the world. So I'm boring a half inch hole and in reality, the finish mortise is going to be quite a bit wider. It just occurred to me, do I have a half inch dowel? So we're just going to drive that in. I'm just for illustration purposes. So I run my square up against that. I am nice and perpendicular the way I want to be. And as I bring the bevel gauge up, whoops, look at that. I missed my angle. I didn't go steep enough. A lot of that is probably my own fault because of the way I've got this positioned, I probably should have changed this whole orientation of, of the clamping setup here because the angle was directly away from me and forcing myself to lean forward, which is just awkward for boring, should rotate this whole thing 90 degrees so that I can angle it this way. But like I said, I'm not terribly worried about this because I can ream in that angle. Now, the closer you can bore the hole to the proper angle, the less reaming you're gonna have to do. Um, let's learn from that mistake and bore the other holes but orient the whole setup so that it makes a little bit more sense. So what I want to do now is I'm going to keep this angle in my, which camera am I looking at? I'm going to keep this angle in my um, first bevel gauge. Can somebody write a, um, uh, the programmers in the room, can somebody write some sort of script or or something that would have a light come on above the camera that's currently live broadcasting so that I know quickly which one to look at. <laughs> or does somebody want to just like come hang out my shop and like wave and say, look at this camera. So 10 degrees is what we're going to do now. I could probably just set it off the gauge itself, but Veritas went to the trouble of making this fun fence for me. All right, let's think about this. I'm going to be boring out, so I want to set it same orientation I did before. So the, the blade is kind of bending towards the handle. Just double check that. 10 degrees, right. So Instead of where I was boring before and trying to work the angle away from me, actually the way things are set up now actually works pretty well because I can more readily see that angle as I'm boring and I'm not contorting myself in any one way or another. And I can set my square perpendicular to the sight line bore that way. I think that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. Any questions so far? This is truly one of those things that you need to just do it. Um, I am not, I'm not a geometry whiz by any means. I tend to be a very visual person. And I also tend to get kind of really caught up in why things are the way they are. And I, it, it just gets a little complex sometimes. The first thing, first time I ever did this, it was just kind of like, oh, well that's stupid. I've been making this so much more complex than it has to be. 
So it really is just one of those nice things to just, to have a pattern like this, already have your angles figured out for you and your sight lines laid out and just do it. And you'll quickly kind of see that it's not really that complex. So now I can very clearly, as I'm boring, sight along my bevel gauge and very clearly see that, that that's even. The other thing that's cool when you set the, the bevel on your sight line, your bevel is probably going to be this face of the bevel is going to be square, pretty dang close anyway. So as I set that on the sight line, and if I bring my other square up, I actually, I can see that the blade is running straight up and down. So I have my square here maintaining this square angle, but from my perspective, as I'm sighting here and I'm sighting this gap, I also can see that the center line of the, the shank of the bit is in line with the blade, which is square. So not only is this giving me my 10 degree angle, but it's also giving me 90 degrees. And this little extra square here is just kind of double checking. One of the other nice things about using auger bits for this is that lead screw is doing all the work. If you have a bit that you, you have to actually press down on to advance it, you end up kind of getting over top of it and you lose the frame of reference. As I bring my line of sight in from the top, I can't see as much as if I'm working straight in from the side. And I realize I'm in kind of tight at this point. Let me back this camera out a little. Maybe it'll make a little bit more sense. As I'm boring, I can step back and I can look down. If I've got to lean into it, I lose that line of sight. There is a reason, I suppose, for boring from the bottom to the top because any blowout you get gets carved away. I'm going to end up doing some planing on the bottom of this seat anyway, so I don't really care in this case. Set back in the hole. And again, double check everything. I'm working from the top down, so I want the legs to splay out. So I make sure my angle is facing the right way. Make sure I'm on my sight line. You can stop and check. Peter Galbert uses a series of mirrors so he can see, so he doesn't have to, to change his um, point of view. One of these days, I've tried that. I did that um, when I was at the Woodwright shop when I built a continuous armchair. It's pretty cool, but I, uh, I don't know. It just feels like an extra thing to have around my shop, an extra thing to have to find a place for when I'm not using it. So I just haven't, haven't bothered to uh, add that in. Okay, so let's just double check stuff here. I'm square in that direction. Not quite on my angle. I've got oh, maybe a half a degree of deviation. Square, see, boring square holes is not hard, people. <laughs> Almost exactly on the angle there. But again, it's really not super, super important to nail that angle every single time. Uh, okay. So now I want to ream my holes, and I will be reaming from the underside of the seat. So, like I said, any of this like blowout that we've ended up with doesn't matter because these are all going to be enlarged, enlarged, enlarged. I almost just said enlarged um, as we uh, as we bore them out. I'm going to keep it in this orientation and work on the back legs first. So. 
the reamer, there are certainly, you can buy metallic reamers and such. Um, I've used those. I used one made by Elia Bazzari before. Um, this one is made by Tim Manny. Um, it is, in my opinion, far and away the best reamer available. Um, first, it looks cool. Second, he puts a little inlaid brass section on top because the point of this reamer is something you're going to be referencing off of. So it's nice that this is super, super strong and durable and won't wear away over time. Um, he's got this cool little depth screw adjustment that actually changes the um, uh, aggressiveness of the cut just by raising and, and, and lowering the blade. The other cool thing about this is the body of the reamer is square to the long axis. A lot of reamers will actually be that tapered angle all the way to the top. So as I come in and I drop this reamer in place, this face, let me see if I can put this a little bit better. This face, the square face, relates to this resultant angle. So what I wanna do, and I'll use a larger bevel here, but I want the straight part of the cylinder to match this angle. If this part is tapered, you have a different angle than the 90 meeting the bevel and you have to readjust your bevel gauge by half the taper angle. So if this taper is seven degrees, I need to alter my resultant angle by half of that or three and a half degrees, which is not the end of the world. You get a, a gauge like this, it's um, set up in half a degree increments. So I could take my 10 degrees and I could decrease it to 13 and a half degrees on this and just line it up with the tapered face of the reamer. But because this is square, I don't have to adjust any of that. I just have to work against this nice square edge. So it's, it's a minor thing, but it's just one of those little things. It's a, the fit and finish of this reamer makes it really, really nice that I don't have to do that. Uh, where did I put my long bevel? So now I'm working from the bottom. So I want to angle my bevel out. Yep. Okay. Where's my... I'm just gonna bring my pattern back to bear. And what I'm looking at is I'm finding myself another reason for boring from the underside of the seat. Because just occurred to me, my sight lines, I've just labeled my sight lines on the front of the seat and I need my sight lines on the underside of the seat. Such is life. So I'm just going to quickly transfer some registration marks to the underside. So everything I said earlier about doesn't really matter which side you lay it out on, just talk that up to this is a guy who's only made five Windsor chairs in his life and not a guy who's made 100 Windsor chairs in his life. It'd be easier to lay the whole thing out from the underside because you're going to be reaming from the underside.
center line lined up. Don't you love it when you can't find a tool and it's because you actually put it away? There. No big deal. Sight lines are back now. Did I miss any questions yet? Okay, good. All right, let's. Let's ream some holes. So same type of deal here. We want to ream on the sight line, so 90 degrees on that sight line. Then we also want to dial in the 22 degrees. So as I am lining up my reamer, I want to focus on, in this case, lining up the vertical part of the body, the straight part of the body, the non-tapered part, with that reamer angle or with the bevel gauge angle. Like that. So you can see this gap down here. Maybe you can see, maybe you can't. See this gap right here. This is the difference in the angle, the 10 degree angle and the seven degree taper. This is a three and a half degree angle difference. So this is why you'd have to change it. But if you look up here where the body is straight, you can see my bevel gauge is actually lining up and that's really what I wanna work on. Most importantly, I mentioned how this little tip is a big deal. I can sight down the bevel gauge let me, on the sight line and as I look at it, from a higher angle, so if I come in and look down, what I'm seeing reflected in the light is the very tip of the bevel gauge and the tip of my reamer. And because I've got this set up on my sight line, that helps me to keep the whole thing plumb by paying attention to that. Now, as I rotate this thing, it's gonna interfere with the bevel. So what I end up doing is, Moving the bevel aside, taking a couple rotations with the reamer, and you have to clear the blades of these pretty often, so you're constantly stopping to clear them out. Come back in on the sight line and check my angle. The other thing I'm doing as I'm sighting straight down, I can very clearly kind of not even focus, but I can see that little brass part glinting at me and I can line that up with my sight line, which tells me that I'm square to it. Check with my bevel. And again, you can see it is dead on the shank right there. Maybe if I get closer, you can see it even better. See that? It's perfectly lining up at 22 degrees. So at this point, I, I just wanna push down and keep reaming at that angle. Clear that blade. back and check. All right, that last pass, I leaned forward a little bit. I'm touching up here and there's just a hair of a gap down there. So what that means is now I wanna kind of pull back and increase that angle a little bit.
And now we're right back on the angle again. And the further you go in, the more stable the whole thing gets and the less chance of it actually deviating. Just want to occasionally stop and check how far I have to go. Stop and clear that blade. And from this point on, I should be pretty much, it's going to be really difficult to deviate from that angle because I've got so much of the reamer buried in. I've got probably two to three inches of the reamer sticking out on the underside of the blank here. So it's firmly registered. It's really not going to go anywhere. It doesn't mean just be careless. If you are focusing your pressure straight down, it shouldn't be deviating dramatically, but you know, just keep that bevel gauge nearby. Cut, maybe another quarter inch or so. The good news about these reamers is it doesn't take too many rotations before you've got to clear the shavings out of there. So you can't really get too far off track. It's forcing you to stop every couple of rotations. You can see that it's, it's really not cutting at this point because the gullets are filled up. Still dead on the angle and still square to my sight line. All right, let's hope that's enough because my reamer is now bottomed out. See, this is awesome. That's what I love about Windsor joinery. Is that thing so <laughs> rock solid. That taper just comes and locks up and got about a quarter of an inch of projection there. I think I want to go a little bit deeper here. Actually, no, no, I don't I like that just the way it is because I've got enough sticking out and I don't want to go down to this first knuckle. So what I'm going to do is make a, just a single hash mark here. This is my first leg. That also tells me the orientation that I want it in. One thing, as you come in and you kind of twist these into place, it's always a good idea to keep twisting the same direction. Uh, so I'm twisting clockwise now. As I want to free this, you could twist the other direction. And I just find that that puts undue stress on the leg. So I will actually keep twisting clockwise to free the thing. It's a tip that uh, Elia Bazzari gave me. He had some um, bad stories of legs that actually broke from putting too much torque on them and trying to twist them free. Nathan wants to know if it's easy to get that kind of reamer in a bind and break it. Uh, I doubt so. Uh, I doubt so. God, when did I learn to speak? I mean, this is what you're more worried about, I suppose, would be breaking the blade. But um, 
It doesn't sound all that great, right? When you're first boring into it, it sounds a little bit weird. So I think it would be really hard to actually break the reamer. Um, when you're boring, when you're reaming in there, it sounds kind of weird because essentially you've got a blade that isn't fully supported and you're kind of doing a scraping action, but um, there's not, a, there's really not that much stress on the reamer body itself. Uh, yeah, we are quickly running out of time here. So let me go ahead and bore our ream the other angles and we'll probably have to call it quits at just legging the seat up. We'll have to save the carving for another time. I shouldn't be surprised about that. There's a lot to explain regarding compound boring and reaming angles. Again, in these early stages, you want to check often. My angle's not steep enough here, so I need to go lean a little bit more this direction. There, now I've got the angle where I want it. Overshot the angle just a little bit. So now I need to come back the other way. So I want to lean back towards me. In other words, I'm cutting a little bit more on this wall. And we're talking a tiny amount here. All right, we're back on the angle. Okay, still on the angle and we're getting to the point now where it's deep enough into the hole that it's really not going to deviate all that much. It's kind of an interesting, happy accent in here, but these little plywood bolsters that I'm using, when my reamer contacted my workbench top, that was when I stopped cutting. That was like the appropriate depth. So I have like this wonderful built-in depth stop, <laughs> at least for this particular thickness of bench and length of tenon and all that fun stuff. It actually works out perfectly. Now that will change when I do the front hole, but such is life. Okay, still on the angle. And as I sight down the sight line, I can connect a point on this side of the reamer and this side of the reamer, and I can connect them together and that little brass part of the top perfectly falls in line, which again, that tells me the whole thing is riding square to that angle. Again, I can't overstate just how cool that little brass inlay is on top. Again, this is, Tim is one of those guys that that's all he does is, well, it's not all he does. He does more than build Windsor chairs, but he's been building Windsor chairs for a while and thinking about it and refining the process and everything. And it's just, this reamer is, is a, just a great little tool. Okay, let's finish this hole up.
and I'll mark two tick marks on this leg to set its location and its rotation. Now, finally, I need to bore the front hole at 22 degrees. So I'm going to want to bore it heading that way. Which puts that hole fast in the way. Now, if you remember correctly, this hole was the one that was really not right. So I've got to do, I've got to really lean the reamer towards me, really pull it down to take up those probably three degrees or so that I was off. So every time the blade comes around this side, I'm putting a little bit of extra oomph into it to cut heavier on this side. I'm barely cutting on the top side of the hole. Much better, still got a little bit more to go. Oh, almost, almost. Bam. 22 degrees. Now, as I come and stare down my sight line, and look at that little brass tip, I'm leaning a little bit to the left. So, I've got the angle right, but the 90 degrees is off now. So now I need to lean a little bit onto this side of the hole to straighten it out. And now as I look at the brass bit and my center line, it all lines up and I suppose I could put the square in, but yeah. We're good. We're good. Have I said how much I like the little brass inlay at the top? Have I overstated that yet? Okay, we still got that angle right. So let's just push straight down and finish reaming out this hole. deviated just a bit so I want to pull it towards me and steepen that angle just a bit and we were talking I mean when I say just a bit I mean it's tiny tiny little amounts but again any slight deviation if I started sliding off the angle there's every chance that that error is only going to get worse the more that I keep reaming so I want to be really 
kind of diligent about making tiny little adjustments as I cut so that things don't get too out of hand and then I've got to like doing major surgery to correct an angle. Okay, the angle is dead on. As I sight down here, I'm plumb and vertical. Very, very close. Got maybe one more rotation here. One more round before I clear the blade, I should say. <sighs> Little safety tip, as you're clearing this blade, you'll see how the blade is actually proud of the bottom. You just tap it to the side. It's not in there hard um, and it will pull out those shavings. What you don't wanna do is run your fingers down and it should be obvious this is a sharp blade, but just be careful as you're sliding in and out. I just grab it, knock it to the side and that's enough to clear the shavings. Sometimes I just go back to the other side to clear the shavings and then I just push it down tight and that's all you need. It's one of those things where um, you don't even realize it, but you could be slicing your fingers to ribbons. It leaves nice clean cuts, but oh, let me orient this leg. That looks good. And then I'll make one, two, three, one, two, three. Just in case you can't see what I'm doing. It's kind of hard to see, but there's three little hash marks right there. And it just tells me exactly how I want to orient that leg going forward. At this point, it's a, it's a little arbitrary. I mean, because I am making a, a seat that I plan to just clear coat, wood grain and color and everything has a little bit to do with it. Um, what looks nice, but I also think that it just helps when it comes time to actually like assemble stuff. If you've got those tick marks to work on, it makes things so much easier. Look everybody, I made a stool. <laughs> Ta-da! We have a perch. It's beautiful. It's got a nice angle to the whole thing. See, angles forward like that. And I mean, it's clunky as all hell right now because I haven't carved the seat. But as I walk around the whole thing, my, my legs look nice and even. They're splaying out equally on both sides here. Let me go wider angle for you guys. So as I come and look from the back, my front leg is falling nice and centered in between and it's staying in line. As I come around to the side, the back legs are in the same geometric plane as far as raked back. That looks nice and pleasing. I look at it from the front, pardon me as I block the view. That looks awesome, looks great. So there's the stool with legs. Um, so yeah, I unfortunately I've got to uh, cut it off here, but who was I think, who, what was I thinking, thinking I was actually gonna carve the seat and bore today. So that's the result in angle side of things. Um, next time I'm going to carve the seat. Um, probably gonna just focus on carving the seat the whole time. Um, and uh, then we'll move on to the T stretchers that connect all that stuff. And that's where stuff becomes really, really fun. You start playing with the compound angles and there's some really great chair makers techniques that really just make it stupid simple. So uh, any uh, last questions before I uh, close this off? Are you aligning the grain and the legs to the seat for the wedges later? 
That is a very good question, David. Um, some of that, when I talked about those tick marks on the bottom, um, what I want to do is the, the wedges are going to be oriented to the, the grain of the seat because the, the, no matter what I do, I want to make sure that I'm wedging in the proper direction. I'm not splitting the seat as I put the wedges in. What I'm thinking about with the legs is expansion and contraction and how will that expand and contract as I put the legs through. So technically I could orient the wedge in any direction in the leg and it's not like it's going to split one way or split the other way. It's all going to be, if you drive a wedge deep enough into a leg and wide enough, there's every chance that you're going to end up splitting the leg. What I want to look at is where is the radial plane and where is the tangential plane? Because the radial plane is not going to expand and contract very much. So what I want to do is orient it in such a way that the, um, now again, I'm working with kiln dried material here. If I were working with green material or kiln dried seat and green legs, um, I would want the legs to expand into those mortises. So I would put the tangential plane so that it expands into and um, it expands in, what am, I, what am I trying to say here? In the same direction that the seat is going to shrink around it. Because what I've got is a drier seat and a wetter leg. Now I would probably artificially kiln dry the legs a little bit to get the tendons to shrink up. So I specifically want to like, what's the opposite of super saturated? Totally dry out the legs so the tendons shrink. So once you pull them out of, out of a kiln or like a, a little box with a light bulb in it, you're gonna, um, the legs are gonna start swelling. So I wanna orient them in such a manner that they're going to swell at the same time the seat is going to be taking on moisture from the leg and it's going to swell. And I want them to swell in the same direction so you get a nice locking um, setup. So what I've done, not only, it's so much so hard to look from this direction, but what I've done is oriented in such a way so that the radial plane is in line, the lowest, the radial plane, in other words, the, the smallest amount of expansion is in line with the ingrain of the seat. So the greatest amount of expansion is gonna come in and across the grain as the grain shrinks around it at the same time as there's water going into that. It's really hard to describe. But yes, I am thinking about that. This is, um, I don't want to say it's advanced chair making. It's, it's one of those things that in the first chair that you build, you may not have to stress about it too much. The biggest thing is when you actually drive the wedges in later that you're orienting it to the seat grain so that you don't split the seat grain. You don't have to worry too much about the orientation of tangential and radial planes on the legs because we're talking about relatively small surfaces but it's still a good idea to think about expansion and contraction and how those two parts are going to interact and what is going to lock things in the best um, so that you don't uh, get a joint that loosens over time. If you are building with green wood and you're gonna see the expansion and contraction, that's gonna be so, the differential is gonna be great enough that it's gonna lock it in really no matter what direction you put it in. But much better chair makers than me will tell you to pay much, cl much closer attention to that. Um, so that you can take advantage of that wood movement. Good question, David. <laughs> Bone dry, that's the term we're looking for. Uh, Finrica wood stuff. How important is it to select the correct type of wood for projects like this? It's, it's very important. For a project exactly like this, it's not as important. Why? Because we're not steam bending anything. Um, so, First and foremost, um, and we talked about this in the last section, using kiln dried versus using air dried and green wood. In a perfect world, I wanna use green wood for all this because I can take advantage of just the easy workability and the differential drying nature to lock my parts together. For turn parts in general, using wide open poured woods and ring porous woods like oak and white oak, it's hard to get real details. So it's hard to get a nice smooth surface because you've got those big wide open pores. Think about um, French polishing uh, an oak top or a walnut top. You want to pour, pour fill everything so you get a nice mirror flat surface. Without the pour filling, you're never going to get a clear um, mirror finish on it. Same thing with a leg. With those wide open pores, it's going to look, it's going to look a little rough no matter what you do. You almost have to pour fill your legs. So you want to skip that by using a smaller diffuse porous wood. 
Most Windsor chair makers are going to use maple. Maple's super hard. It's going to hold the fine details of like a baluster leg, but it's also going to give you a nice smooth surface that, let's face it, Windsor chairs are generally painted, but when painted, it's not going to give you that grainy look because of those wide open pores and those ordered rows of pores. Um, second, you're not bending the legs at all. So it's okay to use a really dense, closely packed pore structure like maple. It's not that you can't bend maple, it's just really hard. And I don't, let's just say, let's just say you can't. You can, but I don't recommend it at all. So I don't have to worry about that for the legs or the stretchers. The seat, um, I'm gonna be doing some carving. So I wanna choose a wood that's gonna be relatively easy to carve. I don't want this nasty, super, super hard interlock grain thing that's gonna fight me and give me tear out every step of the way. Um, most traditional Windsor chairs, they're made with Eastern white pine. Uh, across the pond in Europe, they're made with beech. Um, you'll also see poplar being used here in the States. So um, because they're relatively easy woods to carve, moreover, you can usually get them in super wide blanks because, you know, pine trees grow like weeds, super, super fast, super, super wide. So it's not really an issue there. I'm using walnut because this chair, I'm not going to paint this. Um, I also find walnut to be relatively easy to carve and I had a blanket was big enough. Um, you also really would like to have that seat kiln dried. Um, so that is gonna stay relatively flat for you and you've got somewhat of a constant as you're boring the holes for the mortises. Now, if you're doing a steam bending part, say you've got a bow back or you've got a sack back with a, an arm bow, those are pieces that have to be bent and you're going to want, ideally you want a good bending wood. A good bending wood is generally a ring porous wood. Your uh, wide open pores are ordered a nice little growth ring and nice concentric rings and it allows some dead air for compression. Because as you steam bend something, you're essentially compressing the fibers on the inside of the curve and stretching the fibers on the outside of the curve. If you have a really dense species with no dead air inside of it, there's not really a lot of space to compress into. With a ring porous wood, you've got that dead air on those big pores and it will compress into and allow you to, um, to bend it relatively nicely. Red oak, white oak, hickory, ash, um, they're all great species for steam bending. And um, when you're preparing it, you've got to be really, really, really anally retentive about matching your growth rings. That's why we split or rive out those pieces to begin with. That's why when you shape them with a draw knife, you're really focusing on getting a single growth ring plane because if you, if you have multiple growth rings, growth rings are just laying on top of one another. And as I bend that, you see this little section up here running out because the grain is splitting along that line in between. If I have one consistent plane of grain that's gonna bend and it's gonna stretch and you're not gonna have any tear out. Um, it's not to say that you, if you have the slightest little overlap, it's not gonna be the end of the world, but you just need to be really, really careful about that. So traditional Windsor chairs are generally made up of three woods. You've got a dense piece like maple for the legs and the, any of the turnings, baluster turnings and such. You've got a good steam bending, bending strength wood, usually ring porous for your bent parts. And you've got a good, easy to carve piece for your seat blank. So pine, red oak, and maple is what you see traditionally. Um, hickory, white oak also could be uh, put in there. For this particular piece, because there's no steam bending going on, this is a great introduction to Windsor geometry because we're not doing any steam bending. We don't really have to have super, super um, green wood or anything to certainly make things easier. We can just use regular off the shelf lumber um, for this. So long explanation for a seemingly simple question, but yes, you do need to think about what wood that you, you choose for this. Um, that is the true brilliance in the Windsor chair form. It allows incredible strength with a really delicate nature. If you look at really nicely made Windsor chairs, skinny little spindles in the back, those spindles are made from the same wood that you're bending out of, and you can plane them down in the same growth ring, so they're super strong yet super thin. They're also a little bit springy, so when you sit in the chair, it gives a little, it adjusts to you. Moreover, Windsor chairs, any of this plank and leg orientation like this, these are self-leveling. Now any three-legged stool is gonna be self-leveling, but because the legs splay out in all directions, when you sit on this, there is a little bit of weight and pressure that drives the legs out and will always be perfectly centered. The stretchers will help restrain that a little bit, but it makes, makes for a really stable seat and very, very strong because you're relying upon the, the, the strength of the riven wood to do all that.
I love Windsor chairs, if you haven't figured that out. So. <laughs> what a science. Um, yes, but the thing that appeals to me most about Windsor, and, and for that matter, like green wood chair making, is there are a lot of angles and there's a lot of wood science and stuff, but none of this stuff is really observed when the chairs were made. The, the whole idea is you're using a lot of relative dimensioning and, and relative positioning and sight lines and things like that to dial in highly, highly exact compound angles without ever measuring anything. It is the perfect hand tool project, really, because there's, not, there's just not a better way to make this with power tools. I mean, certainly you can drill some holes, but you know, the, it's dialing things in and paying attention to whatever this number is. It's, it's very, very cool. Um, Windsor chairs is one of the things that got me into hand tools in the first place. So let me just leave it at that. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to say good day. Um, and I will catch you. Oh, I should say this real quick. Um, I don't really want to drag this project out forever, but uh, I'm not going to be able to get back to it again until next Saturday. So next Saturday, same time, same bat channel, all that stuff is when I will begin carving the seat. So whatever that is, November something. November 3rd, I think, maybe. Uh, that's when I'm going to be back. So cool, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out, and I'll see you all later.